My name is Vikram Sahaya. I'm an engineer working on a Google.org project. Um, I was introduced to Cliff via some friends who went to Nigeria to set up eGranary uh, at a school. And they were just so amazed at the impact um, that having this information um, being available to the students, uh, it was just you know, um, eye-opening for the students and for uh, the people who helped set this up. So they were really excited about sort of this being a solution which can work today, you know, without waiting for a, a huge amount of infrastructure to be set up in the poorest places uh, in Africa and the developing world. Um, so I invited Cliff to give us a talk um, about his experience with this project um, and the challenges he sees. So, um, so Cliff, the director of the project, uh, is going to talk to us. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Um, is this on? Sure. It's on. Is it on? Can you guys hear me? The microphone? Cool. All right. So um, thanks very much for having me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, to share some ideas about uh, serving the world's poor with information technology. I just got back from a conference in Malaysia, a UN conference on information technology. I heard a great story there. I wanted to share it with you. This guy tells a story about um, uh, a village, a hilltop village in Africa that had petitioned the local government saying, we need some help to develop this village and to improve the lives of our people. And so the, the, uh, the government people got together and they decided education and computers, this was it. So they told the villagers, you know, we'll be there on Sunday, we're gonna bring a bunch of stuff and this will be great. So they get to the end of the road and they have to hire some donkeys to load up with all this computer stuff that they've got. They've got these fantastic plans. Eight hours up the hill, they finally arrive at the village and they tell the villagers, look, we have brought things to improve your life. And the villagers said, oh, thanks. And they took the donkeys. <laughs> um, and that's one of the conundrums of working, working in the developing world, working with the world's poor. Um, you know, we're talking about people who are, uh, making a dollar a day. And, um, but there's a critical, critical need for information everywhere. Everywhere in this world, poor people are dying for a lack of knowledge. And it's, it's imperative that we help them get access to the knowledge they need when they need it. I mean, this is what Google does best, right? Getting people access to the information they need exactly when they need it. And, um, one of, our, one of our missions is to, 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 to develop that. <clears throat> I've been working around Africa since 1982, mostly in water development, but since 1996 I've been teaching about the use of information technology in developing countries. And um, in 2000, or 1999, I went to uh, Nigeria as a senior Fulbrighter and spent a year teaching at a university there and wandering around the country, meeting all kinds of people, uh, vice chancellors and librarians and others at these uh, at universities to kind of discern what their plans, what their process were. And what I found were a lot of people who had very little money, huge ambitions, and, um, and were not confident about their ability to, to grow IT on their campus. So out of that, we founded the WiderNet Project, which is a nonprofit service organization based out of the School of Library and Information Science at the University of Iowa. And we see ourselves as a coach and an advocate for uh, people in developing countries who are setting up their first IT systems. And I guess the, the, first, the first tenant of our work is that there is no digital divide. That's a, that's a, that the notion of a digital divide is a luxury that we are allowed because we have kind of awkward or kind of ironic to say this with a free uh, food counter next door. We have everything we need and digital technology. And through that lens, we look at people in developing countries and say, hey, they don't have digital technology. But from the lens of somebody in, in, in most developed countries, they don't have very much at all. And they also don't have digital technology. So there's a refrigerator divide, there's an antibiotic divide, there's a road divide, there's an education divide, right? Bare and simple, it's an economic divide. They're poor. 
And we are not. We are not in such a way that we oftentimes forget that we stand on the shoulders of giants, that there's generations of infrastructure development and civil society development that makes it possible for us to be in an air-conditioned room with 24 by 7 electricity, right? Makes it possible for me to hand my credit card over to somebody and say, yeah, go ahead and take $40 a month off that thing, right? Totally inconceivable ideas in most of the impoverished world. So um, a lot of the challenges for me in doing this work is, is moving out of this privileged space that I exist in and understanding what it means to spend money on IT. And our main focus, our main purpose is to find low cost, high impact ways to do that. So since 2000, we have had over 4,000 people go through our training programs in Africa. And that is things like showing up with donated fiber optics and tools and doing fiber optics training where a dozen technicians within a week fiber up three buildings for less than $500. Right? They do it themselves. And we, and, and, uh, we just came back from a training in Ethiopia. Um, technicians from nine universities uh, were in our program, and everybody within a week had completely taken a computer apart, put it back together again, done troubleshooting, set up networks, cut network wires, um, configured the machines with all the software, and most importantly, turned around and taught somebody else how to do it. Because the building of human infrastructure is really critical. So we have... Um, our volunteers at the university have refurbished over 1,200 computers. We've collected donations from Microsoft and 3Com and others to take and uh, do installations there. And we're really focusing on really practical, cost-effective solutions um, that, that meet their information needs. We also work on building a digital culture, something that, uh, that we sort of take for granted here is this, just this whole idea, Google Groups, right, Usenet. This whole idea that for, for 20 some odd years now, people have freely been sharing their knowledge with each other, helping each other out, right? And this, all, the, all this you know, Web 2.0 stuff, it's about people communicating with each other and, and, and moving each other along in, in their IT knowledge. These are things, these are, are things that have happened in the last few decades here, which haven't taken root in a lot of cultures around the world. So we're talking about changing communication patterns, changing education, and getting people into uh, cooperating and collaborating with each other. So these are the three challenges I see to scale. And let me say, you know, if you've done any reading or seen any articles about internet and developing countries, it, almost always those are articles about somebody doing a demonstration project. And I'm, I've been around this business far too long. I'm starting to get bored with these, right? Because this is what we call cowplop development. Okay, the cow comes by, plop, ooh, there's development, right? We airlift in a, a computer and with, a, with a generator and a solar panel and a, uh, and a uh, VSAT, okay? And voila, we are connected to the internet, right? I mean, did we, did we think that that wasn't possible? Sure, we can, put, we can put an internet station in Antarctica, we can put it on the moon, right? We have the technology to do that. But none of that scales. All right. I go to a university that has 60 computers, and they have worked really hard for years to get those 60 computers with 128K internet connection. Right? And they have 30,000 students at the university. We know we can put computers anywhere and connect them to the internet if we have enough money. But how do we get 30,000 students working with computers? So the issues are scale. And these are the three issues I see. FaceTime. There are so many projects, and I, I want to do sort of digital dope slap, pow, okay? Because there's people who are in this field, especially people who are selling something in this field, like to talk about uh, big numbers and huge impacts. So they'll say, we put 60 computers in a university. That means 30,000 students have access to the internet. Mm, no, <laughs> right? Unless they line the students up and have them, you know, 30 seconds each every day, <laughs> right? Or, uh, and, 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 and goodness knows, you know, what somebody, 60 people can do with 128 internet connection, not much. So there's a lot of hyperbole in the field. People over uh, emphasizing what they're able to do with the technology. If the students are going to learn from computers, they're going to need 10, 15, 20 hours a week at a computer. And if the electricity is only on for six hours a day, right, 
there's a limited amount of time, limited amount of students who can be served by a handful of computers. We have on our website, we have what we call a FaceTime calculator, where you can plug in the numbers. You can say, the computer lab is open so many hours, the students need so many hours at a computer, you know, and how many computers you have, and it'll tell you how many students can be served. At my university, we have 35,000 computers and we have 28,000 students. That's a good mix, it seems to work. You know, at a university where they have 24,000 students and they, and they want the students to spend 10 hours a week on a computer, you're looking at 8,000 computers. So the, the FaceTime is important. Is FaceTime gonna scale using only new computers? Mm, probably not. Most institutions aren't gonna be able to afford that. When we ship refurbished computers there, our partners pay for the shipping, 300 computers in one cargo container, and those, cargo, those computers are worth $25 a piece. And there are some really different things that you can do in deploying a $25 computer that you can't do with an $800 computer. So it just changes the dynamics. Scaling information access, and this is a huge issue, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump into some numbers and show you some slides about the cost of the internet. But, um, I don't know how many of you uh, want to operate 128K at home, right? But there are universities who literally have spent uh, years getting that kind of capacity for their thousands of students. Um, it's so expensive. The average university in, in, um, in Africa is paying $150,000 a year for a dedicated one megabit connection. Which is wicked expensive. So that's, that's not going to scale. And I'll be talking about the eGranary Digital Library as one way that we can scale information access. And the last thing to scale is human capacity. Um, and, you know, we need a whole bunch of people just like you all over Africa. Right? We need to train tens of thousands of young, bright African uh, people to be able to do what you're doing here. And as you know, if you go back and you recount your education, that was a lot of years and a lot of money to get, to you, get you to where you are today. And we need to start doing that in Africa. It's not gonna scale in the same way that it scales here, because here we can do things like charge people $25,000 a year to go to college. That's, that's not gonna happen in Africa. So what, that's why we're working on models to set up user groups and getting people training each other and, uh, um, and developing, um, low-cost, high-impact training programs across Africa. Here's another digital dope slap, all right? I don't know if you've heard of the One Laptop Per Child Project, all right? This is a group of people who actually know better but aren't following through conscientiously. They're going into countries and saying, all you need to do is buy a million laptops at $100 million, or actually $200 million now, and you'll be fine. But every one of them and every one of us knows that the cost of maintaining a computer over five years' time, right, the technology is only 25%. 30% is training people, 30% is staffing it. So if we want to be honest, we would go into these countries and say, yeah, $100 million worth of computers and expect to spend another $400 million keeping them working for the next five years. And all of that is about human capacity to support and run these systems. So, have you seen this before? Picture of the world at night, all stitched together. And, you know, this, this is one of my points. The easy networking has been done for about two and a half, what, two and a half trillion dollars or something like that. Um, we've done the easy networking. All those lit parts are networked. And, what we know, internet penetration in the U.S. is about 60 some odd percent, depending on who you talk to, okay? We've essentially been able to serve everybody who makes more than $32,000 a year. And if we look at internet penetration in developing countries, it's about the same. We've been able to serve everybody who makes $32,000 a year, all right? Um, but it's those dark places on these, on these pictures where the information is needed the most, where people are dying every day because they can't get access to simple information, where people's uh, economies are suffering for the lack of being able to communicate, not with you or me, but with each other. Digital dope slap number three, <laughs> okay. Oh, but Wi-Fi and WiMAX is gonna fix all of that, 
right? And I just brought this in. This is, this is my little third world country of Iowa, all right? And there's the, there's the telephone coverage map, the, the cell phone coverage map for, uh, for Iowa. The deep orange means you're pretty likely to get a connection. Everything else means good luck, right? Um, Wireless is great in some situations, and, um, but it doesn't necessarily scale for data the way we'd like it to. This poster demonstrates the size of Africa. I don't know if you've seen, there's uh, rumors going around on the internet that Google is going to wire up all of Africa. Now, all this started when Google provided some free software to a telephone company in Kenya, but that rumor snowballed into Google is going to wire up all of Africa. Look at that. All of Europe, all of the United States, all of China, I say good luck. <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. It's going to be trillions of dollars before we get to the point that these areas are wired up the way um, we, want, we would want them to be wired up. And, um, and they've got a lot of other economic pressures on them at this point that don't prioritize putting in networks. This, uh, this uh, graph shows uh, internet use and uptake uh, over time. And as here's the US climbing to close to 60% in 2005 um, in terms of household penetration. Uh, in middle income countries around the world, 10 to 15%. Uh, and that would include India. And then um, low income countries uh, with the uh, I think Tanzania at the bottom there, at you know two and a half percent internet penetration. Again, if we take look at this from one perspective, two and a half percent of the people in Tanzania make thirty-five thousand dollars a year, and they've been served. Um, and there's this, there's a great hope amongst the. Uh, economists and theoreticians in the area that, well, actually, this is just going to be a slower curve, but pretty soon everybody there will be connected. Right? I've been working in water development since 1982, training people in rural villages to drill deep wells using ancient Chinese hand-powered technology. Right? Um, and in most countries, even though all this money has been spent and all this interest has been, has been focused on improving water access around the world, uh, most countries have seen negative or no growth uh, because they can't even keep up with population growth. So is IT going to follow a different path? Mm, don't think so. What's really going to change for IT penetration, if we keep up with the same model, is the economy is growing to the point where people start making $25,000, $35,000 a year. So here are some. Is a map of internet connectivity costs. There's a little inset here of Europe, where the first number, 378, indicates that 378 people per thousand use the internet on a daily basis. And they spend 2% of the average annual population, or uh, income, for their, uh, for, their, for their population. Across Africa, see, we see completely different numbers. It's just in Ethiopia. One person per thousand using the internet and they're paying three and a half times the average annual salary to do that. So you can imagine who's, you know, who's connected. Right? These, are, these are folks from wealthy families um, who, uh, who can afford to go and spend a day's wage and, you know, uh, for an hour's worth of internet connectivity at an internet cafe. So the reality of the cost is that it's just freakishly expensive. Um, and many of the institutions that I'm working with, I've visited 24, 20, no, 26 now universities in sub-Saharan Africa. And every one of them are making remarkable sacrifices to be connected to the internet. And I don't want to embarrass them in making this talk, because it is embarrassing for some to, to, uh, to be seen as inadequately connected, because some of these people have risked their careers, some of them actually risk their lives to put the money aside to get connected to the internet. I literally, I talked to one vice chancellor of a university this last year. His university is a part of a consortium that's getting cheaper internet, which means they're paying $100,000 a year for one megabit instead of 150. Um, but he wasn't paying his bill. And I said, how come you're not paying your bill? 
And he said, he said, well, look, here's, here's what happens. He's like, we don't have any money. If I don't pay my internet bill, I'm going to be embarrassed in, the, in front of the international community like I do several times a month. If I don't pay my salaries, I'm going to get killed. And I have, a, I have a, a good friend at the University of Jaffa, Nigeria, who actually has a machete cut in his forehead from raging, rampaging students um, during a particularly hard time at the university. These are, these are really serious issues for people out in the field. And there is a, um, there's a thing I call bandwidth blackmail, where those of us without any, we don't really understand their situation, we don't really understand what they're going through, you know, we say, hey, look, you guys, there's all this really great free information on the internet. All you have to do is the most expensive thing in your context, pay rent to some outside satellite company to get access to that free information. And, and there's a lot of uh, big decision makers and individuals here who adopt this aristocratic attitude. Oh, let them buy bandwidth. Internet will fix everything. It's great for them, right? And that's simply not the case. So we have to, we have to adjust our thinking to think about um, what it means even for us to, what we think is a com good common thing. Let's just promote the Internet, right? Um, when in fact that is for some people a, uh, a painful alternative. So here is a, here's a demonstration of a comparison between my university, the University of Iowa, and Amada Bell University in Nigeria. Both of us have, for our local area networks, we have a 100 megabit switch, really fast, ample bandwidth for everybody. Outside, the University of Iowa has a 2 gigabit connection to the internet. And still the students complain that the movies take too, too long to download. Outside, Amada Bello has a 2 megabit connection. That's for common use around the university. Okay, one scary fact is that both universities are paying essentially the same amount. The other sobering fact is that at Amata Bell University, that's the equivalent of 30 full-time professors every year. And you have to stop and ask, what are we getting out of a two megabit connection that's worth 30 full-time professors? So in their context, getting connected to the internet as, as blissful as it sounds to us, is a painful thing. We do speed tests. You can come to the WiderNet Project website, and there's a little button that says test your, test your bandwidth, and it'll you know, download several sizes of files and tell you how fast your connection is. So the first bar here um, is a typical American university. We're testing what the users are experiencing, not what the university has purchased. So the students are downloading files from our server at 17 megabits per second. Typical company in the US, two and a half megabits per second is what the individual uh, are, are experiencing. And we have somebody from overseas here, and then home connections in the US, and finally connections from across Africa. And uh, I just, I just did last month's, num ran la last month's numbers, and again, in, unless we're talking about an institution that has some special kind of connectivity, like an American embassy or something like that, the connections across Africa, what people are experiencing are still between the range of 12 and 40K. Not much you can do at that speed. The other problem is that these connections are very unreliable, right? So why we might get happy and say, hey, 2% of the people in Malawi are connected to the internet. If you interview those people from Malawi and say, hey, how's your internet? They'll say, oh, let me tell you stories, right? Because uh, we, we do one set of testing where we ping servers across Africa every 15 minutes to see when they're up and when they're down, okay? And very few of them are doing 24 by seven service. Usually the technician comes in at nine o'clock, plugs everything in because he can't trust the national grid to provide decent power overnight. So he plugs everything in, everybody starts using the system. At one o'clock, there's a power outage. At three o'clock, it's back on again, because they get a few more hours out of it, and then everybody goes home, right? So very unreliable in that sense, and also frequent lapses of a day or more. I teach a course simultaneously in Iowa and Nigeria, and my students in Nigeria will literally disappear from the radar for weeks at a time. You know, modem gets burnt on their satellite dish or something like that, and you know, they're off. And uh, so um, 
We have, a, we have a young woman in Nigeria who is helping to install e-grannies around the country, and she's, she's been keeping a log of what it means just to have a daily conversation with us via email, right? And sometimes she goes to three or four different internet cafes before she finds one that has adequate bandwidth and electricity, right? Um, and uh, probably two days a week, she's just not even able to find one. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite an experience. So it's unreliable. So there's no teacher at any of these universities who can say, you know what, I, next Wednesday, I'm going to have my students do an online tutorial or watch a video. Inconceivable. One, that there'd be enough bandwidth, and two, that the internet is even going to be available next Wednesday. So this is what people have to, have to deal with, even when they are connected. So this is why we came up with this little box here, the eGranary Digital Library. Um, a solution. For, uh, for, for delivering information. It is a local solution. What we do here is we replace bandwidth with store width. We take millions of documents, with permission of course, from the internet, put them in this little box, and deliver them inside the local area networks of institutions uh, that we're working with. So here they have, uh, it's millions of documents maintained by librarians, no pornography, no, no viruses, nothing like that, just educational information. We even avoid popular culture, so you can't get sports scores from here. Um, but there are no bandwidth costs, and it can be used with an internet connection or, or, or alone. But what it does, it means everybody on the local area network has free and fast access to everything in, the, in this collection, even when the internet connection is broken. We have about 250 of these out in the field, and more than half of those installations, there's no internet at, at the institution. So right now we've gotten, you know, in the last few years, we've gotten permission from 800 authors and publishers. We've got the whole Wikipedia. We've got uh, uh, WHO's website and, and, uh, and, and a bunch of others. Um, it's about, tw it's about a 1,200 websites and CDs that are served up from this little box. Um, and that's tens of, tens of thousands of full-length books and journals and, um, and uh, you know, virtually anything you might find on the internet except smut. We have one of these in a prison. Okay. Now, prisoners are kind of unhappy about the no smut thing. But <laughs> I just tell them, you know, we can't find any volunteers who know where to find it. So let me, let me pop out of this for a second and pop over to the e I've got one hooked up here. We don't need no stinking internet, no, no wires, no wireless. This is just it. Um, so uh, let's say we're interested in a book. We've done some cataloging here. Because the first thing that happened when we take this out to the field, when our first prototypes, all these librarians who had never seen the internet before looked at this and said, hey, where are the books? You know, let me ask you that question about the internet. Where are the books on the internet? They're everywhere. So we realized we needed to put together interfaces that would help them get to the information they wanted faster. So now we've, we've, uh, so we've done some, uh, some uh, cataloging here. But let's see. Let's, uh, analysis of Ventures in Wonderland. Click on a page. It opens up just like that. And this is exactly what it looks like out in the field, that fast. Uh, we have uh, videos. How about my favorite site? We'll go to Music. And uh, here's a group uh, called Mutopia. They have sheet music online. So let's go for violin sonata number three. And I can listen to it in a MIDI file. I can download it in a PDF. Do you know what PDF paranoia? OK, this is, this is a, a, a phenomenon of people with behind slow connections. You're browsing the internet, and you're waiting five minutes for every page to download. And then you accidentally click on a PDF file. What happens? You're 20 minutes or more waiting for this file. You're paying five cents a minute, OK? And you can't hit the back button, and you can't hit cancel. You're stuck. So you have to turn off your machine and start over again. So people in Africa are very careful about clicking on PDF files, clicking on uh, video files, all that. I'm not going to be nervous at all. I'm just going to click on this PDF file. It'll, take, it'll probably take more time for the computer to load up uh, Adobe Acrobat than the file itself. And now I've got this sheet music that I can print out and start playing. We have this, and I, I was just visiting with a couple here from, um, from, uh, from the Bay Area who took one of these and installed it at a secondary school in Nigeria last year. And if you go to their Voices of Angels website, you can see some of the stories. But um, they, you know, they talk about how just 
utterly blown away these kids were. They had never seen pictures of the world. They had never under, you know, seen anything about the cosmos or seasons or anything like that. And suddenly here they are freely just clicking on buttons and things are popping up, right? It, it is truly an electric experience to watch people using this for the first time and having this kind of access to information. The other thing, one of the young boys wrote an email saying, he said, we were given an assignment to, to do research on evolution. And he said, you know, the, the concept of evolution itself was interesting enough, but really, what really blew him away was that he found tens of thousands of articles on evolution, that so many people had talked about it from so many angles for so long. All this information that they had no idea even existed, right? And, right, and then it's all right there in his fingertips. So um, you don't know how to play the violin, but you're interested in doing the violin sonata, Let's go to page two, go to the violin site. Here's everything to learn about violins. We'll go to violin lessons here. And uh, here's my lesson for today. There's my music. Here's a uh, button to press to watch my instructor. Oh. It's loading up the video software. And it's pausing. There we go. Now that would have taken 20 minutes or more at, at, at the very few connected places in Africa. But here, um, it pops up almost instantly. So we can deliver high quality educational information to anywhere on the planet. One last, one last demonstration here. We have people who send us whole CDs with software. This is stuff you can't get off the internet because it's an executable file, but the eager entry acts like a file server as well. So I'll click on Bones of the Skull, and this will say, hey, this is, this is an installable. I say, go ahead, install it, and run it. And it's a 250 megabyte program. It'll open up just like that. And now I've got a textbook that I can wander through to learn about the bones of the skull, interact with the textbook, answer questions, even pull up, uh, here it's got a, a demonstration raccoon skull for me to play with. Take a minute to open up the browser and there I've got a raccoon skull. Just like I can pick up one of these skulls here and spin them around and investigate them from any angle. When we showed this at the University of uh, Liberia's medical school, where the students had a library of less than 2,000 books, right, the students just got up and sang and danced to see something like this. Never seen anything like it before. So, let me uh, go back to my presentation here. And oh, do sorry. Press the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so we've seen this slide before, right? Okay, except now it's different. Now that first bar is a secondary school on Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. 50 miles away from the nearest internet connection. And those kids are opening with and playing these, with these documents five times faster than students at an American university. So the speed difference is just radically different. Some people like this because it's a curated solution. Like I said, we have it in a prison here in the US. Right? Um, we have parents contacting us who are homeschoolers who don't want their kids on the internet because of all of the dangers there, but they want their kids to have access to knowledge. Um, and uh, in India, ran across uh, some technical schools in India that were concerned about you know, students wasting their time on the internet, but they were perfectly happy to give them, uh, to give them this information. Uh, so it, it's a, uh, it, it provides some level of safety for those who are concerned about that. There's something, um, well, here, here's an idea. Let me break out of here just a second and show you. When we talk about expanding it, there's all kinds of um, 
ways that that can go. But what we're finding is um, oh, hang on a second. I've got the wrong slideshow. Well, I know what I'll do. I'll mute and run this one. So um, how many of you share your internet connection with your neighbors? How many of you just put, put your internet connection up, wireless, let all your neighbors use your internet connection? Anybody? Why? Why? It'll slow my connection. It'll slow you down. And you're paying for it. Right. But with the eGranary, right, is there any way that somebody on a 54 megabit network is going to overwhelm a SATA hard drive? So we got people out in the field now just buying Wi-Fi, buying WiMAX, putting up a tower, and turning this into a public library because they can share it with anybody who can attach. So one of the concepts we're working on is this whole idea of building knowledge spheres, local knowledge spheres, in which you know, we take the eGranary, we've already talked about, it's got all these wonderful features, and in it we put in you know, the 10 million plus educational documents, 20 million next year, I'm sure, um, all kinds of local information, information from the local school districts, information from the local governments. Uh, if we, when do the planes fly? Where, 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 where do the doctors work? How much does it cost to get from here to there? Right? All that information that people really want to know, local information. We put that all into the eGranary and then um, serve it up in the town. Now, the typical model for that is that you know, we take the granary and we put it on a local area network so that everybody on the local area network has free access. But what we're, what we're seeing now is the ability to take this and stretch it out, adding a WiMAX backbone that'll serve people in a 5, 10, 15 mile range. All right. And then anybody underneath that backbone who wants to connect, they connect to the WiMAX backbone, turn around and turn it, and turn it into Wi-Fi, and deliver it to everybody in the neighborhood. So a, a curated collection, lots of local content, and we can use any kind of device to get connected to this. Right? So we're not getting married to one particular piece of technology. We're still sticking with IP, Wi-Fi, the standards. So we're, we're looking at the ability to serve tens of thousands of patrons with this. And the cost of the internet connection? Well, nothing. So uh, back to my other presentation. Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, so this is like having a tiger by the tail. We came up with this idea because it seemed really practical. All right. We've grown it to 250 installations. Now we have big organizations like WHO and others looking at using this in hundreds of locations around the world. Um, we're looking at a lot of people using it as an adjunct to the internet. Librarians tell us, hey, I can meet 98%, or I can meet the needs of 98% of my patrons right here in this little box. Now, what's the least amount of internet I have to buy to serve the other 2%? That puts them in a position of power that they haven't known before. Right? So um, it's just going in a lot of directions. It's, it's, it's growing in a lot of directions. And we have a long list of 150 things that people have asked us for. You know, can you make it so that I can put my own local holdings, you know, from my library in here? Can you make it uh, so that we can communicate via email uh, locally, but still be able to go out? Uh, can you make it so that we can block, hook it up to the internet, but block certain people or certain types of uses so that we preserve our bandwidth? There's all kinds of um, requests that people have brought to us, right? And my job is to say yes, right? Because technically, we can do all these things. Logistically, ye, that's a little hard. <laughs> you know, we're a nonprofit organization out of a state university, um, so we live hand to mouth, uh, mostly students and volunteers doing the work. But we're looking for people like you who can take on one task or another and start to build this. Because what, what we want to build is a world class information service in a box that any poor institution in the world can purchase, pop in place, and immediately do whatever they do more effectively. And we have to remember, before the internet, millions and millions of computers were sold. 
There's a lot of things that can be done with computers and communication technology on local area networks that make people effective. There are companies in the US with tens of thousands of computers connected to a local area network, but not one of them can reach the internet because of uh, employee efficiency and effectiveness and a number of other things. So there are, um, uh, there are a whole host of ways that we can build access to information, access to communication in low-cost ways in developing countries that will serve their very critical information needs. So um, we're looking for partners. We're looking for people to help us, to help fund this, to help participate in writing the code, to participate in finding the content and getting the information in there, and in organizing the content. Uh, most of you are interested, I'm sure, in computers and computer science and the like. Um, how about a Google, Google labeled portal in the eGranary for teaching computer science in developing countries? Where you go through the millions of documents that are in the eGranary and pull together the, the good ones, right? To make a curriculum that teachers can deliver out of the box. All kinds of stuff can be done that way. I just got back from a trip to Ethiopia, and I got to tell you that the um, the hard part for me, I would go out during during uh, you know, between breaks of doing our training program and walk around the university, and it was you know it's a gorgeous university, and beautiful flora and fauna, and some of the most fantastic birds I've ever seen in my life. They look like they were created by Pixar. Okay, um, but to stand there in the in the in the uh, in the shade of a of a of a tree and watch the students meander around and congregate around the university there it was like being in any other university in the world. Bright, beautiful young people. Some of them strutting for each other, others hiding behind their handbags. Right. Boys showing off, girls showing off. Um, everybody chatting and carrying on. It was, it was a picture that we've all seen a million times. But there was one thing missing from this picture. Not one of those students was carrying a book. Not one. Not that they didn't want to be carrying a book. There are just no books to be had. So for somebody like that, it is an absolute miracle to sit down at the internet or the eGranary and click on buttons and have information just pop up. And uh, uh, we've stumbled upon this idea, a way to make information available to the majority, seven out of eight people in the world who don't have access to the internet. And uh, now we need to grow it and appreciate your help, your advice, your ideas in making that happen. Thank you very much. says that, oh, okay, so the question was, um, we're identifying different groups that, uh, that need access to information, but how are, what are we doing to make it more accessible to them? No, it's or, how are you actually collecting local information? Collecting local information. Because a lot of information, at least I found a lot of information that you want to get up there is even Right, right. So um, the... Um, we're working with, you know, it, the interesting thing is that what people, and I, local communication, local information is the most critical. That's one thing we learned from the GSM revolution, right? Is that, you know, the 70s and 80s, if you go back and read the hyperbole 
from the 70s and 80s about the telecommunications revolution. It was all about, hey, these folks in Africa need to call New York and London, and we need to, we need to create systems for them to do that. Well, it turns out that, in fact, once they got GSM phones, they're not calling New York and London. You know, pull out your own GSM. Who are you talking to? You know, the last 10 calls, more than, most of them are probably to your family or to friends who are within a few miles, right? It's that local information, local uh, um, uh, communication that's really important. So we're working with groups to, I mean, they can, anybody who creates a website can add it to the eGranary if they know what they're doing in just a few seconds, right? But we're, we're working with, in fact, we're, we're in negotiations with Intel right now to help sponsor building a platform to make it just incredibly easy for local people to start plugging information in. They should, you know, we don't want them to have to reinvent the wheel. So we're going to be creating prototypes of, you know, if you're a university, these are the kinds of information, you know, and, and building content management systems in the background so that people can just start typing and, and adding information um, uh, blithely to the, to the collection. Um, we find there's a, in the projects that we do, we find there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. There's a lot in the last 10 years, people have produced documents in a digital format but not in a web format. And so we work with them on getting those converted quickly and put into the eGranary. Well, the one thing we find for sure is that when people see themselves in this technology, they get really excited about it, right? So that's uh, one, one of our, our main foci is, is getting that done. So we're working on coming up with more consistent and easier ways for people to add their content uh, to the eGranary. And then one of the things we offer them is that when they have digitized their material, if they want to share it with the rest of the world, we'll host it on our web server at the university and we'll put it into the eGranary so they can share it with others who also have the eGranary. And we're talking with some government agencies, for example, who, who see this as a way to get their, their local content into the hands of, uh, of people in their own country. Yeah. Yeah. Can you deal with language and literacy barriers? Uh, language. Okay, two questions there. How do we deal with language and literacy? The, the language, you know, all the back end stuff for the eGranary is Unicode compatible. So we can, um, we, could, we could do any language. Like I said, this has all been done on, um, on a, a, a shoestring budget, right? So we've had to focus on the one easiest language for us to do English. But um, it's, you know, it wouldn't take too much money and too much time to make other language versions of it and we have integrated content in other languages already. Um, the literacy issues, um, there's a number of them. Uh, and, uh, in fact, we're working on one of the projects in the prison is, is about um, teaching reading skills to the prisoners in the first place. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be done with that, but that's a... Um, uh, well, there's several lev levels of literacy that we work with. Teaching people to read is one. We can put the resources in there and make it possible for teachers to teach reading. Um, the other bit of literacy is about information literacy, right? Um, people who've never seen the internet before, right? I mean, in 1996, most of my colleagues were arguing against the internet. Oh, well, you know, that's for geeks, you know, I don't need that in my house, <laughs> you know, <laughs> really. Um, and, uh, and for many organizations getting the e-granny for the first time, they're back in 1996. Some people love it, some people think it's a bad idea, right? And how do we get people to shift their thinking and shift their information access behaviors so they start using this? But one of the things we can do with the eGranary far better than we can do with the internet, um, one of the issues of information literacy is being able to sift through, you know, go through 100 documents in an hour and contrast and compare and come up with the more pertinent information, right? We can do that much more easily on the eGranary than we can with the internet because there are people who are waiting 20 minutes to get one document, and then they get married, take it home, introduce it to mom. You know. So there's a whole lot of issues there. Um, but we see ourselves as sort of the enabling platform for people who are working on building all kinds of literacy. Yeah? Yeah, uh, my question on the touch on what she asked. Uh -huh. um, I used to set up internet cafes in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Uh -huh. uh, that's the only way to help the board line. But one thing that I realized, because I used to work for an ISP, was that most of the communication in the computer or whatever was usually that people left sending emails using Google, Yahoo, Hotmail. Mm -hmm. Most of those servers are located physically here where you yeah. go. Mm -hmm. So whenever I want to send a friend across town an email, that 
email will go to Europe, mm -hmm. come back to a guy who's across the street. So one of the problems we have realized is that uh, it's very important to keep local content local. Yeah. Like with this the concept now, and they have blocked, I mean, what area in the networks within Africa, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they don't have latent issues, like you were saying. If you ping a server right now in South Africa, you'll get like 700 milliseconds talking back to you. But if you're somebody in South Africa talking to somebody maybe in Zimbabwe, which is nearer physically, mm -hmm. you get a, a, a response like that. So I want to add that this is quite useful in the sense of local being local. Right. Like for instance, uh, somebody sent an email and said, why is the logic slower in Africa? But of course, it has to go to Europe when it was back. Yeah. So if there were like co-location points in Africa, where when they are sent each other in, the, in Africa, it right. doesn't have to go to India or Europe. Right. Because the guys are across the street. So yeah. this is a very good opportunity to mm -hmm. keep local uh, content, as you are saying, infrastructure. And if we're talking about making people really effective and making their lives safer, making them more efficient, all that, um, an email, you know, most email there, most of my colleagues at, at universities across Africa don't know the address of the guy in the room next door, right? Because everybody's got, you know, disparate accounts on disparate systems and there's no directory, right? So they can, they can communicate more blithely with somebody in Europe or America than they can with somebody in their own institution, right? But we know, when we do analysis of email boxes, unplug them at most major institutions, 90%, up to 90% of the communication is internal, right? It's inside the, the, the home email system. And, uh, and so we can make them 90% effective just by putting local email there. And of course, when I, we do some bandwidth analysis, go and plug in our, our, our laptop and cap, capture every packet and look. And, and in some places, 50% of the bandwidth is just email. Because people are going out to some server overseas where a 4K message becomes 150K of dancing advertisement, right? And, and that's really inefficient and, and, and expensive. So, yeah, there are a lot of things we can do building local applications on local servers um, and then making the distinction, making it, making it really easy for, you know, when they run out of information in their local thing to, for, to slip out to the Internet and get exactly what they need yeah, at a low cost. You had a question back here? What's that? How much does one of these libraries cost? How much does a library cost a university? Um, too little. Okay. And I, this is a weird thing, because we, we set up a bad, bad, a bad business model um, that we're, just, we're wrestling with. We made a, we made a deal with the, uh, with the authors and publishers, and this is how we get so much participation, that we're not going to charge people for their content. And uh, boy, if I could sell it once, I'd be a millionaire because there's some great content in here, right? So um, what we sell is the logistics of getting the drive prepared and shipped out, all that. So it's $750 for a 750 gigabyte hard drive. That's dollar a gig, OK? Um, and we have a server version, which can serve thousands of people on a local area network for $2,800. So as you can imagine, in fact, in most countries where we have the e-granary, you can't buy these two devices blank for that amount of money. <laughs> so how often do we update? How much money do you have? And I, this, is, this, is, this is like the most intriguing question, right? And this is my own big dope slap, OK? When I first started this program, it was all in, it all hinged on being able to update this information out in the field. So we spent years writing an update mechanism, a new protocol for updating machines that aren't even connected to the internet. Okay, and it works marvelously. You give us your website, you tell us every, you, know, you update it really about once a month. So once a month, we check our copy against your copy. We find the differences. We add all kinds of metadata. We index it against a large index, and then. Boom, we packetize everything to go out the door. How it gets from here to there doesn't matter. Internet, intermittent internet, CD-ROM, DVD. We've even used digital radio, world space radio, to broadcast changes. Okay? So, and then you know, somebody can download it from the internet, put it on CDs, and circulate it around their country. You know, we've, got, we've got all that stuff figured out. Okay. So here's the wacky part. 250 installations in the world, only six people are paying for updates. So some lessons I took away from this, right? And I just started walking around my university being the boor, opening up people's textbooks, and oh yeah, this book is five years old, right? Educational information doesn't change that much. 
And for most people out in the field, it makes more sense for them to say, okay, we can serve, like I said before, 98% of the people in our, in, our, in our school with this information. And some people need the most precise, you know, uh, most current information. Well, they use the internet. Right? So we have an update mechanism. Some people are using it. But um, uh, the, 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 the criticalness of that information being fresh um, has, or I've, I've learned over time, is not as important as I thought it, it once was. A year old Wikipedia is still pretty cool. Right? And the librarians, these, you know, these, are, these people are sharp and they don't have any money. So the, the librarians say, hey, you know what, that hard drive is going to die in five years. In five years, I'll buy another one and I'll get all my updates for free. <laughs> you had a question? Okay. So two questions. The first, I'm sorry. <laughs> the first, the first being. Um, oh yeah. How 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 do how, how can we turn this into a profit making or at least a cost recovery organization? And the second one being, what's our what's our policy for getting? How do we get the content? So the um, we have a business plan that has us you know being copacetic in five years, but it involves people. Um, buying services from us. And it's not, it's not inconceivable. We just got a grant from one group to create a portal for uh, violence and in, or injury prevention in agricultural settings, right? So we get our students to work on pulling information together. They gather volunteers to get to work on the project. And, and that's really where we see our, us making money, is actually building more services and doing the research and development for this. Um, we have started with um, identifying young IT savvy people in the countries that we're working in to do the installations, right? And we're, we've come up with a social entrepreneurial model for them to make a good living, but one that's above board where everybody understands who's getting paid what um, uh, so that uh, they do all the field support and, and installations. Um, uh, so we're working on building those models. Um, there's a chance we might have to raise the price of the e-granary to cover more of the development uh, costs. Um, and I think a good part of our problem right now is simply that we've just been unlucky in, in grant applications in the last year. When we did the project in Ethiopia, where we went, we sent 300 computers, we trained a whole bunch of technicians, they paid for all that to be done, right? Um, and that's, that's really what we need, is, is more people saying this is a valuable thing for us and we're willing to pay, you know, to have it done. Um, but, you know, I'm a fuzzy-headed professor. <laughs> I have no idea if that's really going to work. Uh, I have a lot of um, colleagues around me who understand business better who are constantly um, throwing their hands up in the air <laughs> about, about my ideas. So my I'd love to. NSF money cannot be shipped to that's my understanding. What's that? NSF money cannot be shipped to other companies. That's my understanding. So, yeah. so this, that's the reason why I asked. Yeah. Well, you know, we've talked with people at the NSF, and they said, oh, well, that, that's interesting. But, you know, and sometimes what, what I'm really finding now is that there's a, there's a really keen internet centricity to a lot of people's planning. Because it, it, it is actually a glorious vision, and I would love to see it happen. I'd love to see everybody in the world have broadband, right? That would be wonderful. And so there's a lot of people still hanging on to this hope, right? I'm on my internet buzzkill tour saying, no, that's not going to happen, at least not for the next couple generations. We have to come up with something else now. But there are still a lot of people holding on to this idea that somehow the internet is going to catch on. When we, when we were doing market growth stuff in the last 10 years here in the US, we were trying to convince people who had money that it was worth spending their money to be on the internet. Right? But this is a completely different kind of equation that we're working with in developing countries. These are people who have no money and are, are lacking in a lot of things. Right? And can, trying to convince them to be on the internet is almost mean. 
So um, what I'm finding is a lot of organizations I'm working with I have to go out and they have to try the internet. And after they've tried the internet, then they come back and they say, OK, what's the next best thing? <laughs> and so that's, that's, that's where we are right now. In terms of gathering content, we do a lot of low-hanging fruit stuff, looking for creative commons, open source, uh, public domain kinds of material. Um, we have, a, a, the, we have a ton of music material, tons of linguistics material, just because we've had volunteers who are interested in those subjects going out and doing that. A lot of water development, because that's what I'm into. <laughs> you know, a lot of computer science stuff. Um, and then a huge amount of medicine and public health. And that's really, that's where our volunteers have been interested. But anybody can send an email to librarian at widernet.org with a request, and we'll try to find volunteers to go out and get that material. And I wanted to show you one other thing that we're doing here is that we're building portals. This is a really interesting lesson. Went to Uganda a few years back, met with some teachers, gave them a demonstration of the e-granary, and they said, wow, that's fantastic. We don't need it. And so most of development is really about listening. So spend some time with them. And what they said is, you know, there's too few teachers, there's too many students, too many of their colleagues are, have died of AIDS. Um, and the government, all, all, all they can hope to do is train students to the national exam so they might, some small percentage of them might pass the exam and get into college. And so that's all they focused on. They said, we're teachers, we don't make curriculum. Somebody, like most teachers in the world, somebody makes curriculum, they give it to us, we decorate it and deliver it, right? So, um, so we had a graduate student spend some time with them the following summer, and now we have volunteers working on creating a portal. And this is where I think, it, it, this, is, this is sort of where um, the magic happens here. Uh, what we've done is we've taken the uh, Ugandan uh, O and A level curriculum and turned it into a hypertext menu. And this is something that teachers, this is a, a, a paradigm that teachers are really interested, they're really familiar with. And as we go down through um, the, um, through the curriculum and get to the endpoints, there are links for them to click on that will take them to resources that they can use to teach that concept right, in their classrooms. So we make it really easy for the teachers to drill down. Um, and we're, we're developing a whole host of portals as, as people come to us with, um, here's my water portal. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, hand pumps drilling. Um, with links to, you know, it's a bird's eye view of a thousand websites, you know, for people with specific interests. Yeah. And we're finding this is having a bigger impact in the field. Uh, we have a search. I'd, I'd show it to you, but it's kind of embarrassing because I'm at Google. <laughs> but we're finding the portals are more used than the search engine because, you know, for the, for the people who fit that profile. Yeah. Question back. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sure, you bet. Um, yeah, we have, we have our, ours, our search engine is you know, based on Lucene, you know, Java, um, up front. Uh, we do a lot of little customizations with it, like trying to make local content rise to the top of the list faster, um, you know, those, those sorts of things. Uh, but again, it's all been done by students and volunteers, so, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's quaint, <laughs> okay. and it works, but it could definitely be improved. So uh, I think we should uh, stop here. Uh, Some of you know, uh, get out for lunch. Charlie's uh, been joining us. Welcome. So uh, okay. thanks, sir. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you.